about what are the possible defects in two-dimensional carbon structures. So I'm not saying defects in graphene because graphene by definition is, um, you know, a defect-free single layer of carbon. Hmm. So let's say defects in two-dimensional carbon. However, we do know that when these graphene-like sheets or graphene layers, when they are present in bulk carbon materials, in that case, especially, for example, non-graphitizing carbons, then we know that there are there is a significant number of non-six-membered rings uh, and that is in fact responsible for the curvature. That is why we get these curved carbon structures and when we have a very high curvature, we also sometimes get completely closed structures, uh, for example, fullerene-like structures, hmm, which uh, result in the closed porosity of these materials. So we know that these kind of, uh, uh, you know, the six-membered uh, uh, sheets can also contain the non-six-membered rings here and there. Okay, also in the case of graphitizing carbons, it's not like graphitizing carbons do not have any uh, defects, otherwise we wouldn't have to anneal them out. Huh? So we perform the graphitization at very high temperatures, hmm, we perform the annealing because we want to get rid of these non-six-membered rings. Hmm. And that is how we actually increase the diameter of our crystallite. Hmm. So we increase the LA. So we know that in the bulk carbons as well as sometimes when you're trying to make graphene, you may get uh, these uh, hexagonal carbon sheets which contain non-hexagonal structures. Okay, so these are, uh, you know, this is when we are talking about 2D carbon sheets and um, often what happens is when you're uh, manufacturing graphene using the CVD technique hmm, that we have discussed in detail, in the case of CVD fabrication, you will often, it's, it's already very difficult to control, uh, you know, the geometry or the size of your graphene, also the layer thickness, maybe you will not get single layers, you will get multi-layer graphene, you will get few layer graphene and in that case, the structures that you obtain often contain a lot of, uh, you know, uh, defects, so to say. Now, whether or not you call them graphene, this material in bulk is actually used for a lot of uh, electronic applications, electrical applications, device fabrication nowadays. So let us discuss what are the possible um, possible uh, geometries of these defects. Hmm, okay, but also in addition to these geometries, you will find some other geometries as well. But there are certain defects which are sort of more stable than the others. Hmm, okay. So let us talk about this here. One important thing is also that the defects definitely influence the properties of your graphene. Sometimes they introduce, uh, in fact, new chemical reactivity. In principle, your graphene should be relatively um, inert. But if you want, if you have a certain, um, let's say, unpaired electron, a dangling bond somewhere in the middle, or if you have just nothing but a, you know, a high energy structure, a structure which has a lot of strain, in that case, you may actually find that your graphene is more reactive compared to the one that is that does not contain. So that is the actual graphene, the defect-free graphene may not be as reactive. So here and there, people actually introduce defects hmm, in order to uh, in order to get certain special type of chemical reactivity. Also, sometimes um, the grain boundaries in a graphene, for example, uh, they lead to a better electrical conductivity or definitely a different pattern of electrical conductivity along that uh, boundary hmm, or dislocation compared to the rest of the structure. So definitely, if you do have, um, you know, uh, some unusual structures in your graphene sheet, you are going to get some unusual properties as well. Okay. Now, let us talk about it this way, that whether or not uh, the defect containing structure should be called graphene, we can, one thing we can definitely uh, assume or we understand that graphene is a good model, good experimental model to understand these defects because defects and the stability of defects and what uh, chemical properties, what new properties will it introduce to your material, these kind of things can be understood theoretically as well as experimentally. Now, if you can actually uh, get single layer uh, uh, graphene structures, for example, by removing them from HOPG, in that case, you can indeed understand, you, this is a good experimental model for us to understand, uh, you know, what are the kind of defects that can exist in 2D materials. You see, I told you in the past, uh, it was believed that even 2D materials are not stable. Hmm. Now we know that not only they are stable, they also can contain defects and still be stable. But to what extent these defects should be called defects and then should be whether or not we should call it graphene after that and not. This is something, um, you know, debatable, but we are just trying to understand the geometry of defects here. So graphene for us is a good um, experimental models, model. Hmm. And what you can also do is you can uh, have a look at this uh, graphene 
in your uh, under your uh, transmission electron microscope also there is something known as scanning tunnel in uh, tunneling microscope it's known as stm so what you can do is you can uh, you know see your sample see the surface scan your surface of the sample and some of the very very advanced uh, tem and stm uh, setups they can actually give you the atomic uh, resolution hmm. so in that case you can indeed uh, often visualize these defects as well one very important thing however is that um, your transmission electron micro when you're performing the uh, tem experiment the beam itself can cause defects hmm. so uh, typically if you're using a beam of uh, more than um, 80 kilovolt hmm, in that case so uh, 80 kev hmm, in that case you may end up introducing defects even while imaging your sample hmm. So this is also something that you need to know. However, there are uh, transmission electron microscopes that can go down to even 30 uh, kilo electron volts. So in that case, you there is a possibility that you can see such defects hmm, or you know you can really get images of them. Okay. So here is um, uh, th this is some basic descriptions. These kind of defects in hexagonal carbon sheets, graphene-like sheets, they are divided into five. Types, huh? and I have mentioned the names here stone wheels defects single vacancy defects um, and others so you know in general defects in 3d materials how are they so you have point defects you have line defects and you also have some defects of 3d nature like screw dislocation hmm. or you can have you know some sort of uh, slip plane so you this is uh, those things are only limited to 3d materials you're not going to have a stacking fault uh, for example, in the case of graphene, because it's a single layer, so there's no stacking, there's no question of stacking. Hmm. Stacking falls of graphite, by the way, we discussed in one of the lectures, and I think you should also go through that lecture if you're, um, you know, if you're interested in this topic, uh, or if you would like to relate the defects in graphene and graphite, I, I think that's a, uh, something that you should see. The point here is that some sort of dislocations or defects are not possible in a 2D material because of the fact that it's 2D. However, what is most prominent in this particular case hmm, is the point defects. Hmm. You also have line defects, so your grain boundaries can be uh, considered line defects, but point defects, number one, just by having any non-six-membered ring, so that you would call uh, a point defect, but sometimes also it's not just one ring that is distorted or that is non-six-membered, but also it's a set of rings. Hmm. So sometimes it's the, you know, the, the defect has a certain geometry which propagates through, let's say it involves four graphene, uh, four hexagonal rings in that sheet. Hmm. Okay, so you can have these kind of point defects and then you can have grain boundaries. You can also have add atoms, by the way, you can have carbon add atoms. So on the next couple of slides, I'm actually going to show you some of these, uh, some of these pictures of these kind of, uh, or at least the illustrations, the drawings. Hmm. Okay. So as I mentioned, the line defects um, are the grain boundaries, but here there is one very interesting thing again. So all of these defects, um, there are two ways of understanding them. One is theoretically, uh, as I said, that, you know, if it is uh, for the crystal structure, if it is even possible to contain such a defect, hmm, how much energy it adds to your crystal structure. So those are the things that can be understood, uh, you know, theoretically. When, it, when you want to understand the, the defects chemically or experimentally, then you will often perform these chemical reactivity experiments, but that um, it's very difficult to perform such experiments with single layers. Uh, so you will often have this average effect of the entire material. So that is also, um, it's not that easy to uh, obtain. So now what you often end up doing is this TEM, STM imaging. And I already told you that uh, one problem with that imaging is that you may end up introducing defects. Another problem is that um, TEM images are, they are the uh, 2D projections of 3D material hmm. and the entire material whatever let's say you have 10 layers of your uh, graphene uh, the 10 sheets of graphene inside your focal plane or within your focal plane in that case all of them will will look like they are they, you will not be able to, to get any depth perception hmm. so that is why what of, uh, often happens is that when you see a structure so they see here is the image again um this was taken um you know using um when we carbonized a phenol formaldehyde okay so this uh structure you see this yellow box i have drawn here okay so this is the point where you see now you could say that this is a grain boundary hmm. or um you know some sort of dislocation or it also you know you may try to analyze but there is also a possibility that this these can be two layers stacked on top of each other because all you see in the case of uh, you know tm images of graphene is the edges 
this is also very important that you see only the edges and you only see you know the one problem is the lack of depth of perception uh, but also the fact that you see only edges hmm. or at least that those are the the edges are brighter than the rest of the structure because you know uh, you know how uh, transparent your uh, uh, you know the, our, our carbon material is transparent to and especially graphene transparent to uh, optical light also transparent to electrons so if it is a single layer it's really difficult to uh, to uh, image it see the second image of the same location just by changing the focus hmm. same location so in this particular case you see that there is nothing there's pretty much nothing visible right it's the exact same location Hmm. And this is just by playing with the focus of uh, you know of your uh, of your imaging. Hmm. So this can also happen. There is a high probability that you have something like this. The structure actually is not even just one layer, but it's uh, there are two layers of graphene. Hmm. Okay. So there are uh, you know there the, you need to be very careful when you are performing TEM imaging. Um, and when you recognize and say that oh this is a defect or this is a grain boundary then you need to be very uh, especially careful because you may not be able to um, you know you, you need to make sure that your interpretation of the tm images is uh, correct and you need to uh, do the, you need to perform the imaging also in various ways just you know by changing the focus changing the location to ensure that um, what you're doing is um, is is correct hmm. okay so a lot, uh, other than uh, these uh, potential defects hmm, there are also the edge symmetries sometimes that are broken so uh, what do i mean i think i told you i don't know um, the edges can be either zigzag type zigzag hmm, or armchair type hmm. so these are the two uh, you know acceptable uh, sort of uh, configurations for the edges of graphene layers but often that so this is one more you know additional type of defect that you have um, at the edges you have a little bit of uh, you know very strange structure sometimes one atom is just uh, you know so that it's like uh, what can i say rough edges huh, rough edges so they do not have any specific type of uh, uh, symmetry uh, but they have some other type of structure which again makes also them uh, more chemically reactive already the the edges of graphene uh, have dangling bonds because they are, there is no termination so to say hmm. so you have dangling bonds there already and sometimes if the structure is also not according to these two symmetric uh, you know uh, arrangements in that case you can also have higher reactivity along the edges of graphene so that can also be considered a defect hmm. okay so now let us see some of these images as i told you okay so here on this slide you can see five types of uh, defects in graphene hmm. all of them are point defects okay so um, the first one is the stone whales type of defect and now um, i don't know how clear it is but i hope you can see that these there are four graphene layers which are involved uh, sorry five uh, four hexagonal sheets rings that are involved in this defect hmm. okay now here you see there are two rings that are involved in this defect Hmm. Okay, in this particular case, this is kind of an interesting uh, structure. Hmm. There you have an add atom, so you have an additional carbon atom here. Hmm. Okay, um, so these kind of defects you you know in in the context of 3D materials, or you know, are you even when you perform doping and you have uh, interstitial uh, you know atoms. So something similar, but this is uh, you know we number one we have uh, no foreign element, but only so all the defects that we talked about are the defects without the addition of any foreign um, you know atom but it is just a carbon atom which has been uh, you know during its formation it somehow arranged itself in a certain position and then maybe afterwards there was no um, you know not enough energy for it to uh, to anneal out or to to form a you know standard uh, hexagonal type uh, structure so that particular atom then now stays there hmm. okay so this is the add atom uh, vacancy here you can again you can see that there are these um, you know three no actually four rings that are um, involved in uh, this particular type of defect so these are called double vacancy defects and they are of different types so here you can say even more than uh, more than four there are multiple uh, rings that are involved in the formation of these defects okay so these are some of the point defects okay so now let us talk about the line defects so you see this this like structure so i have shown the direction of the burgers vector here okay 
Um, so you can see that you have also, you know, certain type of line. So when the uh, one, uh, there is a, often the line defects actually propagate uh, from, uh, you know, various, or they are a connection of various uh, point defects. Hmm. So if there is one point defect here and then here and then here and then here, all together you can call it a line defect or um, often for the entire structure to gain um, uh, at least, a, you know, slightly lower energy state, it will try the, these defects, the point defects will try to connect with each other and form a line defects that is still slightly lower energy or it's a, it's a, a more preferred uh, configuration. Okay. So here on this particular slide, you can see there are all these different line defects or dislocations, which ultimately lead to the formation of a grain boundary in graphene like structures. Okay, so after discussing all of this, now we are moving on to um, some notations again related to the crystal because um, this is important for, uh, you know, graphene and also for carbon nanotubes and in some other things that we are going to learn in our coming classes. Okay, so now what we are going to talk about is known as the NM notations. Hmm. So NM notations are very important because these are basically, this is a method of describing uh, a certain location on a graphene crystal. Hmm. This becomes even more important when we talk about, let's say, carbon nanotubes. Huh? If you remember in the beginning uh, of the graphene lecture, I told you that if you fold the graphene uh, uh, sheet, then you, uh, you, know, you get carbon nanotubes. That well, that is not really chemically true. It's not like, you know, this is the method of preparing carbon nanotubes or something. But why do we say that? We say that because, um, you know, this is the way of describing the crystal structure hmm, or a position of any certain uh, atom on a graphene sheet, which accordingly will also define, uh, you know, uh, the orientation of your carbon nanotube. So you probably also remember that if you had, uh, you know, uh, zigzag type of carbon nanotube so the ends at the, you know, of the carbon nanotube. So for example, if you have something that looks like this then in that case you have this is your zigzag type carbon nanotube hmm. and if you have some sort of uh, you know this uh, this kind of structure at the towards the ends then what this is your armchair type of carbon nanotube so if uh, basically to define the uh, you know the axis of your carbon nanotube and to define the orientation then also you use the nm notations but i'm actually describing it here because NM notations are also uh, occasionally used for understanding the defect in graphene. So if you want to tell somebody that, okay, this is where my graphene, uh, the, the defect is, hmm, or, uh, you know, a non-six membered ring is situated at this location, then you're going to give, uh, you know, NM coordinate that this is the position. Okay, so let us talk about this. Um, so this is actually something very simple. Hmm. Uh, if you you take your lattice along your, uh, you know, somewhere on your graphene sheet, then whatever you have two lattice vectors, right? A1 and A2. So along A1, whatever distance, distance you need to travel from the origin, hmm, that is known as uh, N. And along A2, whatever uh, distance you travel is known as uh, M. Hmm. Actually, N and M are also exchangeable. So A1 uh, can be associated with M and A2 can be associated with N. Hmm. There are also a few other things in the in the graphene crystal that are allowed, which are actually otherwise in many other types of crystals that is not allowed. Hmm. So for example, how do you take your, uh, um, your primitive unit cell? Hmm. So if you remember, what we have discussed previously is something like this. Hmm. So this is how we take our primitive unit cell. Hmm. So we have two atoms, A and B. Hmm. These are not equivalent, you know that. And this is one way of, uh, this is basically the usual uh, method of uh, considering the unit cell of, gra uh, of uh, graphene. But it is also possible hmm, to take your unit cell like this. Because this actually does not change anything. Hmm. You still have two atoms. Hmm. And um, this uh, this is basically even the size of your, uh, the length of your vectors and the direction of your vectors does not quite change. Hmm. So in that case also, this is one more allowed uh, configuration. What is also allowed, interestingly, is that you can change the angle. So for example, you can also take this particular rhombus as your unit cell. Hmm. So why can I choose this as my uh, unit cell? Because if you think about it, your Graphene sheet is it, it's made of hexagons and these are symmetric hexagons. Hmm. So they all have six fold symmetry. You can rotate your entire graphene sheet in, in any way. Hmm. So you can actually also choose any point as your uh, origin. 
for, for I mean in this particular case when I'm going to describe the NM notations I'll take this particular uh, point but all A sites can are can be exchanged with uh, you know it, any atom that is of A type can be exchanged with any other when I say exchange that means the location um, I can choose any of uh, uh, my A atoms as my origin or any of B atoms as my origin hmm. the only thing that I need to keep in mind is that A and B type atoms are not equivalent and again it's not nothing to do with the chemical structure but the fact that they are uh, you know they do not have the same time types of bonds surrounding them huh? or their neighbors are not the same so anyway a and b that you know already are the two types of uh, neighbors okay so now coming again uh, back to the nm notation so if i have mm, uh, let's say this is my uh, you know the, the, the this is the one that i have selected hmm, my as my crystal lattice now i have this uh, vector let's say a1 and this is my a2 vector you know that these are at uh, you know 60 degrees they are not at 90 degrees so this is not a cartesian system okay so um well now what i need to do i take one point any one point here say hmm, on top and this is uh, what i need to define what is the what are the coordinates of this uh, this given point hmm, okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to see how far do i need to uh, you know travel from my whatever atom i have selected as my origin okay so this is my origin and this is the vector now you can see here that how many uh, you know how much distance did you travel one time a1 two time three and four times a1 so this is my four and of course we have not uh, you know covered any distance along a2 so that is zero mm. so this is as simple as that this is my four zero point now when i talk about carbon nanotube fabrication using so if i take the same graphene sheet and i roll it up mm, okay then what happens now this given four zero point and my zero zero point should overlap only then we will uh, you know get a complete tube okay so if four four zero and zero zero they are overlapping in that case this vector this entire long vector that i have defined here this vector basically becomes your periphery or your circumference uh, ference of your uh, of your tube so basically this is the circumference and this vector in fact is often called either circumference or chiral vector so when we talk about uh, the carbon nanotubes then we are going to talk what is chiral and what is achiral but the idea here is uh, this is called the chiral vector and this is denoted by c Hmm, okay, so sometimes it's called circ circumferential and sometimes chiral, but you know, what does it mean? Sometimes also you will have another vector that is, you know, that is known as the um, the axis vector because obviously this is the axis of your uh, carbon nanotube when you're rolling up this graphene sheet. Okay, so now one thing from here you understand is that when you have zigzag type of carbon nanotubes, then the coordinates are going to be N0 type. Hmm. Okay, because uh, you know you're off, always going to have this kind of uh, this kind of configuration. So n zero, if somebody gives you you know that the, my carbon nanotube is ten zero, that basically uh, means that it is uh, you know you already know that this is a zigzag type of uh, carbon nanotube. Okay, so now um, we will talk about the other type, the armchair type of uh, carbon nanotube. Actually, armchair type of uh, you know. Um, symmetry or how to define that location this is important for us also on the graphene sheet irrespective of where do we define it okay fine so this is again my um, graphene sheet mm, okay what i'm going to do here is i'm going to also add one more uh, set of hexagons mm. and the reason for that is that when i talk about the armchair symmetry unlike when i was talking about zigzag mm, in the case of armchair it is always good to have even numbers when we are talking about uh, you know when we are describing the structure so for example when I take my lattice now hmm, I will choose this lattice hmm, this here okay this is my lattice hmm. and uh, I'm selecting this because it is parallel it is in the direction of the point that I want to describe and this is uh, going to be my point that I'm going to describe is this one okay so the idea is to take the lattice such that you know it is you're you're in the parallel direction okay so in this direction i take the lattice and then now i want to uh, you know if you if you want to redraw the lattice number one two 
n, 3, n, 4. Okay. Now here I am. Why did I so? You see that in each lattice, I am covering sort of two hexagons, unlike in the case of uh, of uh, zigzag where I was covering only one hexagon. So it is um, it is then easier to define it for a certain point, hmm, your NM location, where you have you know the even number of hexagons covered. Hmm, okay. So now let us um, let us see how do we do that. Okay. So again, this is going to be my origin. Hmm. Now how how much? So I have this point this uh, lattice vector as my a1 and this is a2. Hmm. Okay. How do I get to a1 and a2? Hmm. So if I want to reach this given point, hmm, then how much uh, distance I need to travel along a1? That is one times. But how much along a2? Well, this vector here. If you see that this is also equivalent to a2 vector, hmm. neither the direction nor the magnitude is changing. So I can also call this and, and you know, this is um, a similar vect vector. Okay. So now if you will see, I travel, you know, one, one times along a1 and one, then another one time along a2. Hmm. Similarly over here, a1 and then a2. So the coordinates of this point are going to be two times a1 and two times a2. Okay, so this is if you have this kind of I described it like this, and I was also taking the uh, you know um, the the uh, this point here rather than this point because I wanted to describe that if you want if you have this n n type of carbon nanotube when we talk about tubes hmm, in that case what you're going to get is the armchair symmetry in your carbon nanotube. Hmm. So you will when you have the armchair symmetry you will always have these sort of two or three so you this does not like just end at half so you will not have a carbon nanotube which is like this okay so you will you will sort of complete this armchair hmm, or, or armchair geometry and that is why we took this uh, you know rather than 1.5 hexagon we took or, or you know one it's not 1.5 hexagon it's actually three hexagons uh, so you don't take three hexagons but you take four because you also want to have this entire thing completed hmm, the armchair completed other this is actually this very structure is known as armchair this structure hmm, because if you will see it it actually looks like the you know um, something like a chair hmm, okay so this is the second type so now we understand what is the nn or n0 type notation now the third one is where you describe a chiral type carbon nanotube and when we talk about uh, you know in the context of graphene then we talk about a certain uh, point which cannot be described just by using either armchair or zigzag type of uh, you know uh, notation or calculations like how we did it so this is the third one um, this is called a chiral uh, type uh, when we make a tube out of it then we call it chiral basically it is neither this uh, you know but neither of these two symmetry okay so this is our third situation hmm. i have uh, uh, i have selected some point here okay this point if i um, you know if i try to draw a vector from my origin hmm, then you will see that it's really difficult to uh, reach this point just by using our um, you know either zigzag or uh, or your um, you know the uh, armchair type uh, symmetry okay so how do we calculate what we basically need to do is we need to see how do we reach this atom Hmm, okay, so what is the possible path? Is this the possible path? Hmm, okay, in that case, uh, you may not be able to, uh, you will just reach this point here. Hmm, okay, but you will not be able to reach the origin. So then we will, we will probably also need to follow some other path. So let us again go back to first selecting our lattice here. Hmm, okay, and then again, the same way we have our lattice vectors, which are um, A1 and A2. Okay. Now, um, how much do we travel to or how do we get to, you know, how do we reach this point? So there is one also option that we travel along this, this, this and this here. Hmm. So basically one time A1 and one time A2, that is simple. Hmm. So one time A1 and this vector again is our A2. Hmm. So one time A1, one time A2, we reach this point. And then from here, if we had the other, uh, you know, type of uh, uh, unit cell or uh, yeah unit cell then we could have just walked in this direction two times hmm. and this you also you know that it is equal to a1 hmm. this distance you know that this is equal to because this was the when we were drawing the n0 type of uh, uh, of structure in that case also we saw that if we took the lattice vector um, you know lattice somewhere here hmm, 
then this was also equal to a1 okay so now you know that two times if you travel along a1 and here this was one more time along a1 so in this uh, this one here okay so we traveled one once along a1 twice along a1 and three times along a1 so our a1 coordinate becomes 3 and a2 we have traveled once now you have 3 1 as the coordinates of this point what this means is this is something called nm so now you don't have nn type also you don't have n0 type of uh, of point now what you have is nm type type of point and if you draw a carbon nanotube then you're going to get neither zigzag nor um, armchair type symmetry um, it is going to be kind of any random mixture of these two types of uh, positions hmm. and in that case what you will call it you will call it the chiral type of carbon nanotube